Ok, très bien, nous pouvons recommencer. Euh, J'ai le plaisir de présenter Emiliano Zaccarella, euh, spécialiste de neurosciences cognitives avec une référence particulière euh, au langage. Euh, Emiliano a étudié à Sienne aussi, hein, euh, Master Hello. Language and Mind de Sienne. Ensuite, il a obtenu son PhD euh, à euh, l'université de Leipzig et euh, de Berlin, euh, avec la grande spécialiste d'imagerie cérébrale euh, Angela Friderizzi. Euh, et il travaille maintenant à l'Institut Planck de euh, Leipzig. Euh, Emiliano a donné beaucoup de contributions importantes dans le domaine de la neuropsychologie et des euh, sciences cognitives, neurosciences cognitives du langage. Je voudrais ju juste souligner euh, un aspect. Il y a beaucoup d'excellents expérimentalistes, spécialistes euh, de euh, neurosciences cognitives, mais il y en a très peu qui connaissent aussi la linguistique, très bien, comme ah, dans le pas. cas d'Emilia. De, euh, et euh, donc, euh, comme vous le verrez, dans euh, sa présentation. Bienvenue merci. à Paris et merci d'être ici avec nous. Merci, Luigi. Donc, euh, bonjour à tous. Je suis Emiliano Zaccarella. C est, c est, donc, je vous remercie pour euh, votre présence ici. C'est mon plaisir. Je, je suis vraiment très honoré. Merci, Luigi, pour euh, cette euh, invitation. J'en je suis, suis vraiment très honoré d'être ici. Je suis honoré de t'avoir connu, de t'avoir ici. Euh, comme communion, euh, la présentation se fera en anglais, je suis désolé, mais euh, mon français est un petit, comment on dit, rusty, ça marche ça. Bon, euh, et on peut partir maintenant. Donc, euh, d'accord, le um, um, title de la présentation présentée aujourd'hui est « The Combinatorial Linguistic Mind uh, ». Et le goal aujourd'hui est de vous donner quelques neurolinguistiques perspectives du travail que nous avons développé dans les dernières années past few years at the Max Planck Institute in Leipzig uh, in my group, starting from my PhD, and uh, uh, especially with the Department of Neuropsychology headed by Professor Friderizzi, and uh, sponsored together with uh, most of the work by the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft, which is the centralized uh, um, uh, sponsoring center for research in Germany. Overall, uh, again, the goal is that to uh, offer you in a way that we could be as informal as possible some potential approach at the interface between linguistic theory, psycholinguistics, and especially neurolinguistics, with the goal to see how we could eventually test how comp competence can be represented in a human, and as we'll see later in the last part of the talk, in a human uh, brain. So very briefly about me, thanks uh, Luigi already for introducing me earlier. So I'm a group leader currently in the neuropsychology department of Max Planck Institute for Human Cognitive and Brain Science in Leipzig. Um, and I've done my PhD in cognitive sciences at the MPI together with Uni Potsdam and the Berlin School of Mind and Brain, uh, part of the excellence cluster um, at the Humboldt University. And as Luigi already mentioned before, I hold a linguistics and a bachelor in communication science at the University of Siena together with the University of Edinburgh. Um, Because of my background in linguistic theory, um, and it was shivering this morning too, I went back to in time this morning when I entered the room and Luigi was giving the talk. Um, to my first, very first lesson at the university in Siena was exactly linguistics, and two hours later was semiotics, so it was already quite clear divide what my future would have been. Very happy the first two hours, quite disappointed the last two. Um, Um, my approach to um, experimental linguistics starts with the observation of few basic facts about human language. Um, let's consider a sentence here, the ship carries tropical flowers. Um, well, we immediately understand the sentence without any, any, any hesitation. We immediately grasp the, 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 the content, the structure, the subject, the verb, some objects. Now, uh, the point that I want to make is very uh, simple. No one has ever produced this sentence before, but you're immediately able to understand it. And we can prove that by going to Uh, internet and Google Grams very quickly. And the point is that when we look at the co occurrence of biograms like the sheep or the sheep carries until four, uh, four grams, so we see that all of them, like the sheep, sheep carries, carries tropical and tropical flowers, they all co occur with a certain uh, amount of frequency in, um, in the n gram uh, corpus of Google. But the sentence, the sheep carries tropical flower, never occurred to us. 
No, unless we were immediately able to understand it without hesitation or pause. Um, if we go further, um, we can play around now with meaning and I can produce something like the ship dreams of liquid glass. This is arguably um, meaningless, but nonetheless we understand the structure of the sentence. So if we are poets, we could even try to get some meaning out of it. And again, if we do some very little empirical testing, we again can prove that although we're immediately able to understand the sentence, at the same time all the co-occurrences here were occurring in engrams, but the overall sentence altogether never ever occurred in any corpus of human language so far, at least until 2021 20, at the very back. At the same time, I think that our um, linguistic mind can immediately uh, understand that uh, the sentence here, what's called pseudo-sentence in uh, neurolinguistics, does not make much sense. The plurk fringes the flanny spell. But at the same time, I think we have an intuition to see that there is a potential subject, there's a potential noun following a determiner, there is a verb with some morphological information, and that's probably an object with a, with a determiner, an adjective, and a noun. Another point now is that if we play a little bit more around, we also have an idea that if we shuffle words around, now all of you can tell me, well, the sentence does not really make sense, but importantly, also missing some syntax. So we are immediately able to tell, well, the sentence doesn't really make sense. Also from a syntactic point of view, there is no ordering uh, nor um, hierarchical organization. So to summarize very briefly, we could say that in our daily lives, um, we constantly share complex state of affairs during communication. Uh, of, um, it, we do that by combining words into an unlimited numbers of uh, phrases and sentences of any length. And it's very beautiful to see the continuum uh, that l between Luigi's lesson this morning and few of the uh, observation and the starting point that I'm making here and potentially conclusion later on. So we are faced with this uh, um, potentially a limited number of phrases and sentences of any length, uh, which, however, we might not have produced or heard before, as for example, A and B, but which can easily tell if uh, they are grammatical or not, irrespective of meaning. Now, one interesting point is that uh, this is also true for different modalities. That's, for example, sign language, German. So the physician invites a professor to the left. That's a Deutsche um, Gebärdsprache, so German sign language. But we can also create uh, pseudo signs, as for example, the one to the right, which to German language, uh, German signers looks like pseudo signs, uh, pseudo language, although that's Brazilian sign language, but for a German speaker, they would say, well, there is some syntax, I can tell that there is a subject, there is a verb, and there is a, a, a regardless now the order of the object, but nonetheless, also signers can easily tell if something makes sense, if something is syntactically structured, and if something is um, meaningless and syntacticless. Um, let's move a little bit further about some additional facts, about uh, the simple facts about human language. If we now go very briefly to uh, any uh, corpus, um, for example, that's a classical case of childhood, so collection of spontaneous productions in children uh, vocalizations, what we could see is that within the first three, four years of life, there is a, an increasingly steeping in the, in the mean length of utterance in little, in little children. That's the case of uh, Caroline with, uh, with German, uh, from the German corpus. So the uh, uh, speaking child is immediately able within two years of life to produce continuously longer uh, sentences and phrases of uh, grammatical quality. If you go to the right, what uh, a spurious fact you have seen is that uh, this uh, kind of, this, this increasing pattern is there regardless of whether a child might be a hearing one or a deaf child. However, when we begin to look at non-human um, animals, as for example, classical chimp here from the classical uh, Pierce book, we see that the combinatoriality of this uh, animal here remains um, uh, around one all over, all over years. Um, by sitting in the interface between linguistic theory and neurolinguistics, um, an influential hypothesis uh, that has been put forward now since uh, the, 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 the emergence of the, of the generative grammar uh, program is that an influential hypothesis in, in, uh, in linguistic theory is that human may possess some linguistic combinatorial um, competence which must be based on abstract relationships, which are word categories. So we are able to understand the structure of a sentence, although the sentence doesn't make sense, like for example, a pseudo sentence, which may imply that we have an abstract tendency to look at categorical abstractions, 
that is independent of meaning, that is independent of modality of use, we have seen in sign language as well, which should be readily available during development, the, uh, the second last fact that we have seen, and the last fact which might be unique to our species. Now, moving from these very uh, simple observations, the overarching goal of um, cognitive behavioral science uh, is that to understand how human beings process complex thoughts, constrain ourselves to language. The goal of neurolinguistics becomes that of understanding how the human brain may encode this linguistic combinatorial competence across languages in health and clinical populations, and how this is reflected in behavior through language development and evolution. Now, uh, when you make a step from linguistic theory to neurolinguistic, you must be faced with what is called the mapping problem, which is um, a huge tension between the different disciplines that we'll see in a second when we include a dimension which is only present in, in the second but not in the first. So neurolinguistics stems from the big neuroscience tree as a, uh, a child of the big neurology uh, path, so the study of the nervous system, and as a part of the cognitive neuroscience, so the study of how we react and process and understand a certain stimulus and our response to that. So neurolinguistics is the study of the neural system that has something to do with linguistics. This uh, definition brings us to two aspects of the mapping problem now that are going to be stated. Mapping problem can be essentially defined as a bidimensional problem. On the one side, we talk about an ontological problem. On the left hand side, we have distinct primitives between language, so units of linguistics like words, categories, nodes, and the abstract linguistic knowledge. And on the other side, we have the units of representation neuroscience, which are nerves or um, drones and so forth and so on, and the concrete neural matter. So on one side, we have the units of linguistics like this, and units of neuroscience that are a completely different type. And then we have the very famous granularity mismatch problem that the link between the two elements is not one-to-one. -one. There is no need or obvious explanation why a, a word should correspond to just one cell, for example, or two words to two cells, or uh, a node should correspond to sem cell assembly, and so forth and so on. So on the left-hand side, we have an ontological problem between what we have here and what we have here. On the other side, we have a granularity problem between the units we have here and the way how we could match them to, to the right-hand side. Now, I've been talking about a big missing when moving from linguistic theory, as we have seen uh, the, the past two hours, and now that we're trying to map this abstract linguistic knowledge to some concrete neural matter. Well, what could be the dimension that is, uh, needs to be included when we face the need to see how this maps to here? Well, time. So when we approach neurolinguistics, you begin to think that you are not analyzing a sentence in a temporal manner. So we've seen earlier, like C command relationships or displacement, but you are processing a sentence and try to understand what happens in the brain while you're processing the sentence in real time. So neurolinguistics is asking what's happening in the brain in order for me to make this link between here and here, while my brain is reading a sentence like the ship carries tropical flower, or for example, is hearing it, or for example, is seeing it uh, signed. So we might slightly reformulate the overarching goal of uh, neurolinguistics by saying that by measuring performance factor and how performance constrains competence in real time. So we've been talking about the infinite possibility of uh, recursive embeddings, which is however limited by working memory constraints on attention. By measuring performance, we would like to understand how the brain the human brain encodes linguistic combinatorial competence across a clinical population and how this is reflected through language development and evolution. So we want to test language in real time and try to see how our brain use this competence over performance to understand how language is uh, processed in the human brain. In order to do that, um, we will go very briefly through some notions of uh, competence. It will be very striking to me, beautiful to see how on a very reduced way, I will be just repeating what uh, Luigi has been doing uh, the past two, two hour, for the past two hours. 
Then we'll move into what I call the functional space. So we will be looking at, through fMRI, we'll see in a second what the fMRI is, what the anatomical regions in, involved in synthetic processing are in the human brain, just to establish what we call the functional space within which competence might be eventually reflected, and how the different regions might talk to each other to accomplish this task. Then the central part of the talk will try to bring together timing and functional space and parsing models to bring together the how, the when, and the where of something is happening in the brain while processing language. In the last part of the talk, we'll be briefly mentioning the modality independent of the linguistic system compared to the motor system and its domain specificity. And last but not least, sorry, we'll be briefly going through development and evolution with respect to what we have seen here to propose a uniqueness hypothesis, which is just an empirical hypothesis over which I'm not able to take position right now, but just suggestions. So before starting that, let's begin to look at what abstract linguistic knowledge uh, might be or we need to begin creating experiments upon. So if we go back to the sensor we've seen earlier, 60 years of work have told us that we might better represent this sentence as a set of categories to which the words belong, which can be merged together or assembled together to form constituents of increasing complexity embedded with one another. And the very simple idea is that humans have the capacity to abstract over words to retrieve the categorical information of a certain word, which according to some features can be bind to another element to create more and more complex elements. And syntax would not work on words, but what rather works on categorical elements that we are labeled more and more on. So on this account, a very simple reduced approach that would be needed from competence to be implemented in performance is that to try to answer very simple questions. Where do we know that the is a determiner and uh, apple or ship is a word? How do we categorize them? And we would like to know um, how do we know that these two elements can be bound together to be, for example, labeled DP, to use uh, an arbitrary terminology, but how we go from this level to this level? And last but not least, what happens when we reply the same procedure? So as you can see, this is just a miniaturization of what the program of the past 20, 30 years in synthetic theory has been proposing, that phrases and sentences are hierarchies of constituents that are merged binary to form more categorical uh, complex uh, synthetic hierarchies, and a few categories of relationships generate process infinite new sentences. And um, what Luigi has been showing before, the comparison between ChatGPT and, uh, and uh, the human um, judgment was nothing but another way to say that we have this tendency to how, what we call it in, uh, in your linguistics or evolution linguistics, dendrophilia, this necessity to impose synthetic trees on a, on a linear uh, array of words that we are faced with. Why do we talk about hierarchies? As also we just shown you before, very simply, we need one way to think about that from a, a more a simplistic point of view is that we need anchor points across the structure to work on structures themselves. So I could perform substitution here by uh, substituting liquid glass with a, with a, with a with a pronoun only if I have intermediate anchor points that will allow me to substitute a liquid glass with it, which would not be possible using a, a, a flat structure. Now, we have just given you here a very simple, again, reduced, um, minimalistic um, uh, definition of what competence in human, uh, in human mind might be looking like. But what we need now is also to understand how to drive through the brain in order to see what A could be corresponding to B. So we need to give a very simple, uh, but very, um, very <clears throat> clear information about some concrete neural matter we're working on. So, and that's uh, quite spurious, that's a, that's a human brain. And human brain uh, as a gross anatomy, it's called just a telencephalon, so the outer brain. And we always talk about two different hemispheres, the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. And if we now open them up a little bit, we see the corpus callosum, which is a huge amount of axons linking the two hemispheres. And that's the very first notion. So we have two hemispheres, and apparently one of them is more important than the other for language, regardless of your hand, you writing. 
And when we look at the brain, we describe the brain as we would describe using geographical terminology, uh, mountains and, uh, and uh, flatlands in, uh, in, um, in the world. So if you look at the brain, we use morphology to describe how the brain looks like in terms of folding and holdings. And the cerebral hemispheres are characterized by what we call gyri, a gyrus, or crests of folded tissues and by sulci or sulcus singular, which are the grooves and spaces that the gyri divided are by one other. Although those gyral, uh, gyral and sulcal pattern vary among, about, uh, among but individuals across the cortex, um, some very uh, important ones are found in any and every single brain, which are very important to divide the cerebral cortex in each hemisphere into four lobes. So we have two hemispheres, we have different gyri and sulci, which are like the mountains and the flatlands in our brain. But although these brains change across individuals, there are some sulci and some gyri that are very important as a reference point, which are very needed for us to give addresses to our brain. We have the lateral sylvian fissure here between the temporal and the uh, frontal parietal cortex, the parietal occipital sulcus here, and the central sulcus. And why this is important, because according to this these uh, landmarks, we can split the brain into four major lobes. The frontal lobe, the temporal lobe, the occipital lobe, and the parietal lobe. Frontal lobe, parietal lobe, occipital lobe, temporal lobe. If you now just cut the brain into thousand slices, we do something even more uh, uh, interesting. We can now see, now I'm just cutting the brain along one cer a certain axis, and then we could see that the brain is characterized by what we call gray matter and white matter. The gray matter is where the, uh, um, is where the neurons end or start. The white matter is made by the axons, so that the bodies of the, cer the, the cells are linked into different, the different regions. And thanks to uh, many works, um, like for example, Kibian Brodman in 1999, so a very influential guy who worked actually in Leipzig, uh, for each individual gray matter area, we can look at the, how the layer of the gray matter density values are, uh, are about. So here we could see that given the, the different type of cells and the ending or starting certain layers, we can define different areas according to their uh, cell density profile. And that's what we call psychoarchitectonics, so the lamina. And we look at the concentration of particular nerve cell types uh, in certain region, and because of this uh, density that changes according to the different regions, based on that information, we can create atlases, like for example, the Broadman Atlas. And why is this important? This is important because given the nerve cell concentration, different regions can be divided, and each of these regions has a different number. And those numbers, 44, 45, 21, 22, these are the numbers that we need and that we use to uh, know where we are in a certain part of the brain. So you will be hearing over and over certain numbers like BA44, Broadman area 44, Broadman area 45, which is actually Broca's area, or Broadman area 22, 42, which is actually Wernicke's area. So these numbers are based on satellite tectonics and are needed by the neuro linguists to communicate the data and to say, well, these two areas are involved in certain process A or in certain process B. So that's just a very simple primer for you to understand the, uh, the place we are. <clears throat> now, um, uh, of course, we need, in order to map A to B, language to, to brain, we need also to give a very short info about uh, the type of imaging methods that we use. And we can divide the experimental methodology into the, along two different dimensions. We have a spatial resolution here from very low to very high, and a temporal resolution from very low to very high at the, uh, the other axis. And uh, although we will be mostly talking about fMRI today, and the fMRI has a very nice, um, is a very nice method nowadays, non-invasive, which gives you a very high spatial resolution in terms of millimeters of neural activity but as a very low spatial resolution, although now we are we're improving the methodologies. But essentially, we take a picture of the brain every two seconds. So we are observing what's happening in the, in, within two seconds of the brain, although we are reading a sentence for probably 500 milliseconds. So keep in mind this is as if you're taking a picture on the motorway at night and you leave open your camera for two seconds. 
So you just see streams or line of cars going through the, through the motorway. But nonetheless, this is the most influential method to look at localization in, uh, in the human brain. To the right side, we have, to the right hand side, we have uh, uh, methods that have a very strong temporal resolution in terms of milliseconds, but have a very poor spatial resolution, for example, MEG and EEG, electro, elect, uh, magnetoencephalography and electroencephalography. And then you can move further to have a source space MEG or EEG and uh, uh, electrocorticometry, so where we can stick electrodes in epileptic patients before seizure to see how certain neurons uh, are behaving at the moment. So that's optimal solution to meet both spatial resolution and temporal resolution. As I mentioned briefly before, uh, we'll be mostly talking about fMRI with some discourses on uh, MEG and EEG methodology. Okay, now um, let's now go into the, 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 um, the main part of the first column to the left. So if you remember, so like uh, the search for a, for a functional space for uh, language processing. So in a very standard way, that in the past 20 years has been used to look at areas that are responsible, are involved during synthetic processing in human language, instead of comparing um, sentences, correct sentences, with word lists with shuffle word orders. So the ratio behind that is to say, if I compare the hemodynamic response of the brain of the processing of this structure here, compared to this one, we should see as a, as a difference, those areas they are responsible for uh, the syntactic correctness of the sentence compared to the lack of syntactic processing here. And uh, um, if we go across all studies that have been done using this type of approach, uh, we are nowadays, uh, well, these are just a part of it, like 20 studies, but of course there are um, now more and more coming in. And we use a so-called um, meta-analytic connectivity, meta-analytical uh, likelihood estimation. So for each individual experiment, I can look at how consistent the activation of that specific study is with respect to the process. What we find out is that when we generalize across these old studies comparing sentences or phrases versus word list, we quite uh, interestingly see a clear pattern of regions in the left hemisphere which are involved in syntactic processing. So left inferior frontal, anterior posterior, so-called anterior and posterior superior temporal gyrus are involved during sentential phrasal processing in, human, uh, in the human brain. That's a, just a very simple observation. However, I guess that some of you might have already asked, well, the effect may reflect both syntactic but also semantic information processing. You are, uh, in the very end, you are reading a correct sentence, you're comparing it to word list. <laughs> so can we separate the effect of hierarchy from the effect of meaning. So can we separate the effect of syntactic processing from that of uh, compositional semantics? And uh, the enterprise, at least um, until uh, that started already, like in the early, in the early 2000, has been that of um, creating artificial grammars that might imitate um, relationships that are found for human language without involving meaning. And, um, in the past 20 years, there have been an increased amount of studies on artificial grammar learning and processing that have tried to simulate structures that we see in human language uh, and to uh, somehow um, make them learn by uh, participants in a scanner. So here to the left, you have a classical so-called double embedding structure, which uh, to those of you who don't, do not really speak German or master German might be a, a suicidal uh, process, but something like, ich denke, dass Maria die Hans der gut aussach liebte Johann geküsst hatte. Uh, probably even 60% of German people are not even able to process the sentence. So it's a perfectly classical example of embedding in human language. It simply says that uh, I think that Maria who Hans who was good looking loved uh, kiss Johann. So here you have the important point for you is that here you have three subjects that have a link to three verbs. And the idea is that of taking this kind of example and create um, phrase structure grammar, so called PSG, that would be an AN, BN grammar, and ask subjects to learn these relationships. And then the idea was essentially that of comparing the processing of, for example, syllabic sequences where they knew that LA uh, that, for example, the A can only correspond to a sound like Q, that sound like SA can only correspond to a sound like BU, so participants would hear in a scanner or something like Le, Ri, Se, De, 
kubo fo ge or kubo fo gi. And they have learned that before, and they know that here they would expect a two, but a gi comes in, and then you would see the type of activity that you would appear in the brain when comparing the incorrectness against the correct grammatical structure. So there was a first attempt to see in the lack of meaning how these relationships that would imitate human grammar might be processed in the human brain without considering semantics. And as you can see, the very important point was that uh, we are talking about the very influential pianist paper from 2006, that the posterior IFG, BA44, uh, seems to be the only region involved in detecting uh, incorrect grammatical structures based on this type of artificial grammars that imitate embeddings in human language. So the conclusion that was made by the time was to say BA44 might be involved uh, in syntactic processing. However, <clears throat> and many of you are syntheticians here, uh, current artificial grammars, I do, do not think that they really reflect human language syntax. I mean, this is just an approximation of how human a, a, a syntactic structure might look like, but that's rather a relationship between different elements that do not have any relationship between each other. And that's for me has always been the crucial difference between human syntax and this type of artificial grammars. So essentially, de Q has nothing to do with SA, uh, with SA, BO, O. But in human language, we have complementizers that would link the more innermost element with the top one. Um, and as you can see, the comparison between a, a phrase structure of the type and a language syntax is rather, difference is rather striking. So one first work that we have done in this uh, respect is to try to answer this question to improve studying on artificial grammar by investigating the capacity to use abstract categories to create a hierarchies using artificial grammars or hierarchical grammars that would reflect human syntax. So in this study we had subject learn these sequences, but they could only tell us that the sequence was correct only if he knew that they would belong to certain categories that could be joined together or merged together as human syntax. And to be more precise, children would know that something like uh, A can only be merged with B, and that, for example, to form or C to B to form BC, but this sentence could only be correct only if they already knew that an element BA could be compared with an element BC. And so we explicitly ask them to learn certain items that belong to certain artificial categories and to learn the rules that would imitate, for example, the terminator, nouns, and verbs, how they could be combined together, and compare them with those associative grammars that we have seen before, this phrase structure grammar, so that where the relationship is only based on some independent relationship between the two elements. And the interesting point here is that when we look at the processing of these structures that to us strongly imitate human syntax and the processing of combining element to one another to create structures, we strikingly see again the involvement of BA44 together with posterior STG. So BA44, to conclude this study, is that BA44 and posterior STG appear to support the processing of syntactic hierarchies based on categorical information. So the subject here have no access to real words, they're only working on uh, fake syllables. They know that these fake syllables belong to certain abstract categories, and in order to tell me that be mu coli is correct, they needed to perform this type of build-up reconstruction. <clears throat> now, based on um, uh, mathematical methodologies that we can apply nowadays, we could also further begin to infer how the information between the different regions in fMRI uh, can be passed to another. This is methods that are called, for example, dynamic causal model or Granger causality or effective connectivity modeling. And what we see here, essentially, that it seems that when subjects are asked to process this type of, of structure, the driving input is in BA44, so BA44 is immediately involved, and then there is an interplay exchange between the different regions. So BA44, also based on previous studies on, uh, on more complex synthetic processing, BA44 in Broca's area seems to support the establishment of correct synthetic hierarchies based on categorical information, and the posterior STG, based on a lot of evidence we have, which are not discussing here, may function as a general storage and integration system for hierarchies that are already generated. Now, this was, in a sense, just introductory um, 
for a very simple reason that, uh, and that's been also the study of my PhD work, is that um, I think that the important point of the uh, interface between linguistic theory and neurolinguistics, and including binary branch and including the three different questions we want to have, lexicon, category, and node, I think that an important point to see at the interface between linguistic theory and neurolinguistics is that of reducing the amount of stimulus complexity that we would like to test to investigate the combinatorial capacity that we uh, use to abstract categories from the real lexicon at the most two-word level. So uh, to see how linguistic combination might not be an all-with-all -all process in a way that we can understand how two words can be combined together and how different type of categories can accomplish this uh, combination. So the idea for me is that the two-word combination level is for me the kickstart of the syntactic machinery and is an ideal testing ground for at least three different aspects. So when we look at what happens in the brain, when we ask participants just to read or to listen to two-word combinations, we can begin to observe the properties of the basic combinatorial linguistic mechanism. We can begin to ask questions about the lexicon. How do we know that the and ship are two different categories? How do we manipulate categories to form nodes? And then at the same time, we begin to test the emergence of combinatorial processing in children, so the two-word uh, horizon and understand the evolution of combinatorial processing in the non-human primates. So this is now quite um, a, a standard work and there have been many replications on that. Uh, in this study we had real words like for example the terminal this together with the pseudo word to reduce semantic information be compared with a, noun, uh, with a list of two nouns that could not be compared, combined to one another. And what, when we ask subjects to read these structures what we see is that there is a very clear difference in hemodynamic response activity between the forming of a determinate phrase like this flerk and a list like, for example, epiphoric, meaning that this very specific area of BA44 seems to be highly and more significantly involved for this processing in forming a simple phrase like the terminal noun compared to a word list of two. Um, two syllabic elements. And on top of that, we move further by showing that within the BA44 uh, area that we mentioned earlier in the posterior Broca's area, it seems that the activity that we measure for the comparison between phrases and lists seems to be very clearly localized in what sub-area of uh, the cluster, so-called cluster 33 in BA44, showing that syntactic processing might be very well localizable in this specific subcluster in this area. And this is also very important and crucial, where we'll see at the very end of the, of the work, where we begin to ask whether B44 in evolutionary perspective is also involved in motor processing. And we begin to see that there is a very clear divide between anterior regions involved for language and posterior region involved for motor processing. And we do this by looking how the individual activity of our participants is really localized in this area. And then we see that all our subjects really made use of this specific subregion to understand that this flerk would be a determinant phrase compared to a noun list. Now, at the most uh, basic to our level, the combinatorial processing uh, lacking semantic information or with reduced semantic information seems to involve very specifically neural populations of the most uh, anterior ventral BA44. So a very uh, short conclusion is that when we would like to bring two elements together to form a phrase, the specific area in BA44 seems to be highly involved. Now, we in different studies begin to play around within the interplay between lexical and categories, and now we go a little bit further in what we would call in linguistic theory some feature uh, matching, um, uh, feature matching um, processing. And in this type of study, we begin to play around different two word combinations, such that we had both the terminal phrases, or let's call them N uh, NPs formed by adjective and noun, or DPs formed by the terminal and noun. And the question now begins to say, to be the following. We know that human language is not an all with all process. We do not put words together randomly, but they follow some specific rules based on the categories that are uh, put together. And what we begin to do here is not to compare phrases to word lists, but to compare phrase to another, to try to get an understanding between the interplay of the mental lexicon we have and the category these elements belong to. So we would have the terminal noun on one side and adjective noun on the other side. 
Hypothesis zero is that merge or assembly or composition is always one and the same process and the same region might be involved. Hypothesis one is that depending on the word you're including in the combination, different subregions may be involved. And using what we call multivoxel pattern analysis, which is a nowadays a very standardly used machine learning, artificial, gram, uh, artificial intelligence uh, machinery, we ask which regions in uh, BA44, 45 in inferior frontal gyrus um, contain the most informativity to recognize these words as belonging to adjective noun or the term noun. So in this case, we ask certain voxel to say, tell me if you recognize this word, this combination as adjective noun or, the, or a determinant noun. And what we see is that uh, here we could see very clearly this, uh, this double association, essentially that those voxels that are able to identify the determinant noun as a possible phrase are localized in BF44, while those voxels that are most useful to identify adjectival noun combinations are more localized in the anterior BA45. So these internal subdivisions in Broca's area are sensitive to the recognition of categorical relationships during combinatorial process based on different demands placed on syntactic or semantic processing. So we give, uh, we give for granted the fact that the determiner combination is rather based on a very reduced syntactic information compared to something like a blue book which involves a lot of conceptual uh, processing. And this uh, example here is very striking bef because uh, probably most of you know uh, the recent works uh, within the EEG MEG uh, area like uh, the Ding, Nelson studies, uh, Pepe, that have been showing now that it seems that our brain is able to recreate internal waves that are not present in the stimulus that actually track the considered structure of the sentence. But the crucial point is that following studies begin to show now that this tracking of creating phrases and sentences, it's not a, a one for all process independently of the words that come in, but actually changes according to the elements that are into the, into the forming the, the, the combination. So here you have the terminal noun, here you have a, a verb, a, a preposition, here you have, for example, a preposition or adjective. So, and also the, the people here, like uh, but also look at Burroughs and Casey and Canal, they would conclude that our results, as we've shown before, support a model in which the brain uses word-level grammatical category to build larger units. So we might have some universal characteristic to build elements together, but the brain needs to know what type of elements we are actually building uh, together. And the interesting point is that when we take the different type of um, phrases in input that we've shown before, we see that these network mod modulations during basic combinatorial processing recapitulate what we have seen before for complex syntactic processing with this famous driving input in BA44 and the integration that in this loop goes through the uh, superior temporal cortex. Now, this loop is reminiscent uh, of, um, of what we know now from the structural point of view, where the two areas the inferior frontal gyrus and the posterior temporal cortex are structurally linked by longer fiber tracts along the arcuate fascicles. So um, network mod modulations during basic combinatorial processing recapitulate complex syntactic processing we have seen in the first part of the presentation um, along most probably the arcuate fasciculus. It's always funny that AF is also Angela Federici, so, but that's just um, among uh, our group of people. Um, <laughs> Now, however, what we could also do in the brain um, is also to look at the area of deactivation during some certain process. So if you remember correctly now what I showed before here, this was an artificial grammar study, here you have no semantic information but only syntactic or abstract information, we can also ask the brain the type, the kind of regions there are remaining silent or even drop out um, work during the type of process, meaning I have nothing to do with that. And interestingly enough, what pops up are so-called semantic areas, which is an additional proof of principle showing that what we are testing here has nothing to do with semantics, but probably with some different processes more lightly uh, semantically, syntactically related. So the semantic areas of linguistic network show deactivation during hierarchical syntactic processing. And the funny thing, 
is that when we now compare different phrases that have identical syntactic processing, but they only change in terms of meaning, so for example, fresh apple, awake apple, which is meaningless, or uh, fresh goofle, which has uh, a pseudo word, we see that there is a modulation of these areas that are involved for semantic information, but not for syntactic information. So, the anterior IFG, BA5, 47, DATL, MTL, seem to support some conceptual evaluation during word combination. Now, in this first part, to summarize in this interim summary, we can conclude that Broca's area in the posterior STG support the functional synthetic network of the adult human brain. Within this network, these two regions appear to do different things. Broca's area, specifically BA44, seems to establish syntactic, syntactic structures um, of language sequences according to categorical information. And the hierarchical information may be sent back to the posterior STG in a recursively manner, uh, which would act as a general integration system. And conceptual evaluation involves different areas that include Angular Gyrus, IFG, and the ATL, which are now well known to be uh, for example, very damaged during, for example, semantic uh, aphasia in elderly people. Now, we have just defined a very simple functional space, and I only show you a couple of very simple experiments to show the type of approach uh, that we use to interface linguistic theory with neurolinguistics. But now let's try to, be, to get a little bit more fun um, by trying to bring the different information together to say now something which would be relevant to the timing of uh, synthetic processing, to the where of synthetic processing, and to the when. And essentially what we do here is to bring together the knowledge that we now have about parsing models, what happens in real time when, when I hear a first word and then the second word and then the third word. When something happens across time and where something could happen. And in the second part of our enterprise in our group is that of bringing together these three elements to talk about causality. So we try to infer how a specific region during a specific time frame in the online language processing may be an effect or an impact on how we understand the sentence. We'll be mentioning very briefly left corner versus bottom up models. We'll be talking about mask synthetic priming and the Elan paradigm to look about the timing we will be interested in. And then we take these two information together with the knowledge that we know about Broca's areas to see if this area is involved at a certain point during processing. So now, very briefly, uh, parsing models are just a way to show how we algorithmically, computationally, sorry, we go from word A to word B to word C in real time. And we can understand the sentence doing different things. According to a so-called left corner parsing model, which is a mildly top-down approach, uh, what would happen when you hear the? Well, you know you hear the, you assume this is the terminer, you immediately open up the terminer phrase, and you predict a potential noun that would come in, or an adjective noun, and then the prediction is met, um, and then the element is, is uh, the, the phrase is closed. In the other case, you would have a bottom-up uh, approach. For example, you hear the, you do nothing, sorry, you do nothing, the second word comes in, then you apply a rule or a feature matching between the two elements, categorical elements, and then you close up the phrase. So these two different uh, procedures would give us different timing predictions about how we understand the sentence. So here we are asking, what happens when I hear the? Am I expecting a noun? Am I expecting a word or I just stay silent? I'm, we are talking about milliseconds, of course. You can begin to think about that uh, on your own. But what we do now is we started from behavior and we begin to ask what happens and how quick is syntax? So, in this work, there are behavioral studies, and as, uh, we tested probably all Leipzig here. Uh, there are like five studies, but I will adjust to show very, uh, just one. This is a mask, uh, um, a syntactic, uh, mask syntactic priming. It means very briefly that we show subjects something like the or he for only three, 33 milliseconds. So they are not aware of what they have seen. They are 50-50 chance. They, they have seen something, but they have no idea what they've saw what I've seen, and afterwards, we show a verb or a noun. And the hypothesis is that if I show you he, and afterwards I have the word apple, people take more time to say that apple is a noun, because there is an effect, predictive effect of the pronoun on the expected element, which may be a verb, okay? So this is the hypothesis. This is rudely based on the fact that semantic priming is very existing. In semantics, if I show very briefly apple, and afterwards you see banana, you are very quickly telling me, yes, banana is a fruit. 
So we move it to the syntactic domain. And uh, Stanislav Dehen is also working on some of this, uh, these aspects. And what we did, we also, so for example, we have something like a bird or a chew, everything is completely balanced. But we also had control conditions where we did not show a pronoun or a verb or, or, or a determiner, but we show a fake determiner or a fake pronoun. So he or uh, the, but we also showed something like uh, or fur, they mean nothing. But it's just to see, in the absence of semant syntactic context, if there will be any a similar effect on what we have seen when syntactic information is available. And what we use, we use the response time to this to subtract away from this to see whether syntactic information generates a prediction or not. And the beautiful thing, at least according to me, is that I'll explain the graph, you don't have to understand it. Um, that syntactic information doesn't give you any prediction. So syntactic information does not predict you anything. There is no difference between he walks and nothing walks. It takes you the same amount of time for you to say that walks is a verb, but if you have he, apple, you are strongly inhibited. The conclusion we make from this paper is the following, that syntactic priming is inhibitory and prediction seems to play a little role, at least here, at least in very small context. And to me it's very beautiful because I've always thought that syntax is not based on frequency, syntax is not based on statistics, syntax is, syntactic rules are immanent in a sense, like equations in mathematics. So there is no need for you to predict something in an equation something is coming or not. So we, we only have a very weak behavioral, so weak, a behavioral suggestion that syntactic priming, syntax compared to semantics, which is strongly um, excitatory, um, does not include uh, prediction. And imagine, would it be uh, effortful for you to predict all possible nouns in the world when you hear the? On how would be the prediction of nounness in your life? Very hard to, to complain. On the other thing, we also know that, and this is very old stuff, we are in the EGG world, we know that when there is, for example, the pizza is on the table, if there is a, an offending element after a certain category, we have a response of roughly after 200 milliseconds of a potential so-called ELAN. We know that after 200 milliseconds, we know that the brain is saying, hey, look, there's something wrong that I've heard. Okay, so we have this information. Now, the third information we move very briefly to the where is that we know that Broca's error is involved in syntactic processing. I've told you before. We know that syntax is very quick and we know that prediction is not really there. And we know that we have left corner parsers and uh, bottom up parsers. So the first idea is essentially that of, uh, I can be very quickly here, let's take the dog and let's disturb Broca's area with so-called TMS, let's generate a disturbance on the brain for a few milliseconds while subjects are hearing the. Let's see if Broca's area is A, doing prediction, and B, if there is any prediction at all in syntax. So subject lay, we record EG, and at the same time we zap on the brain while they're hearing the. So we long to disturb predicting processing in BA44. So we would like to show that they are not able to predict the label here. And what we see, uh, and that's a classical uh, now study that we've shown already before, the type of uh, design, the hypothesis is that if BA44 generates synthetic prediction, disrupting its functioning with MS during the first <coughs> word should affect the ERP markers of rise of building. But now the crucial point is that we find no causal evidence at all that perturbating Broca's area at the predictive stage affects the ERP correlates of basic composition. So the ELAN is still there. So we are disturbing BA44 during the processing of the, and afterwards you have a verb, the walks, so you should have an ELAN, but we disturb the the processing, but the ELAN is still there. So it means that Broca's area has nothing to do with predicting processing or predicting a rule in the first part of the processing of the sentence. And here we also show there's a more complex matter that we really destroyed only for a few milliseconds the brain of these people <laughs> in B44. It's not invasive <laughs> at all. It's just to show that the impact of our disturbance were, was very present. And the funny thing is that when we compare something like <clears throat> this a flirk and we remove any predicting processing, 
we very beautifully see involvement of BA44. So we conclude that when removing any predictive effect, uh, we see that there is effect in Broca's area that might correspond to integration phase of two words into a phrase, which support the hypothesis that probably, at least at this stage, syntax works rather bottom-up integrating elements. So the idea is that inferior frontal regions are waiting for the second element to come in and then evaluate whether they can be combined together into, into a phrase. In the last part, I'll be very brief. Um, we can conclude that syntactic composition proceeds in highly automatic fashion. Predictive processings appear to play a reduced role during syntactic processing. And the involvement of Broca's area in predictive processing seems not to be supported by the current data. So Broca's area might rather involve integrative processing due to syntactic processing. And the funny part is that there is converging element uh, evidence from different papers looking at how uh, different uh, parsing models would correlate with hemodynamic response function in inferior frontal gyrus. In the last few minutes, I would just want to mention very briefly different type of works that we look at, first of which is modality independence. It's just to show that when looking at fMRI works on sign language, on synthetic processing, we see exactly the same regions involved, regardless of modality. So the idea is that human brain has involved a lateralized language network with a supramodal hub in Broca's area, which computes linguistic information independently of speech. So speech does not equate language. And we can use a lot of uh, machine learning methodologies to infer how in a two or 3D space, different syntactic cues might be represented in the brain to transfer a motor movement into something linguistically relevant. At the same time, the interface between sign language and neurolinguistics and uh, uh, language processing in evolutionary perspective we begin to look at how language processing per se differs from motor processing under the idea of mirror neural hypothesis or the, the mutual evolution, the co-evolution of language and motor processing. And what we show you in, this, uh, in a few papers now and fMRI studies coming in is that what I mentioned before, BA44 seems to be anteriorly involved in synthetic processing, but the posterior part along the premotor cortex rather involved in completely different type of works. Uh, to select premotor mental representations. And to the different regions, BA44 anterior and posterior, uh, represent two completely different functional patterns across the cortex. In the few last slides, I would like to briefly talk now about uh, the third part of the research agenda that we have, is that of taking the, the two-word horizon to look at development and evolution of the combinatorial synthetic processing. Now, we know that two words combination level is an ideal tested ground, as I mentioned before, to look at the emergence of synthetic processing in children, how a child might begin to produce the book, a book, for example, to abstract over the terminals, and at the same time, how to uh, look how uh, non-human primates might begin to combine different vocalizations together. So, uh, ch uh, children seem to quickly switch from memorization to abstract categorical syntax during two-word production phase. We won't touch this argument uh, too much here, but I would like to mention works from Charles Young and uh, um, um, many people at Stanford University, for example, Michael Frank, for example. But we'll concentrate very briefly on this uh, last part here, on the idea that non-human primates uh, which seem to fail to process artificial grammars that loosely imitate human language, might really not go beyond the two word, uh, the two, uh, the two call vocalization. Um, so these are standard studies that probably most of you know, uh, the classical speech and other studies and many, many more uh, different applications proposed. It seems that during perception, human primates fail to correctly process more complex ANBN grammars, as for example, those who are here. And the proposal, uh, while here we have uh, AB, AB associations, the proposal is that non-human primates do not go beyond the, the two uh, item horizon limit. And I still remember the very beautiful paper that you uh, also, Luigi was mentioning about the merge zero, merge one, merge two hypothesis, where it could be a potential divide between the different, the different species. Uh, now in a huge enterprise uh, with the Max Planck uh, Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology, we have begun now to really look um, into uh, positional transitional properties of localization of, of, for example, chimpanzees in the wild um, and see how these first, these calls actually uh, look, lo uh, look like from the length perspective and whether and how they might be independent of meaning. So the first thing that we look at is essentially to, to show that it seems that at least in production, 
the length, the famous mean length of utterance, but let's just call that uh, the utterance length, goes far beyond two to reach three, four, and five call co combinations one next to each other. And it also seems that a very reduced vocal repertoire nonetheless shows some complex combinatorial network where the different elements are combined to another. But, and that's the first step, it seems that um, the way they combine follows some superficial organization, some such that there are some elements that always occur in first position and some elements that always occur in second position. And some of these bigrams here that I show here um, seem to co-occur only if preceded or followed by some specific structure. So this was just a very first study to look at how in a spontaneous production uh, call combinations might look like in chimpanzee and how, without looking at context, these different elements can be combined to one another. And it seems that chimpanzees actually have a complex combinatorial network where some elements have some special status in the position they occupy in the vocalization system. Now the second step is to look at the relationship between these positional transitional properties and meaning and to see whether testing the combination of calls may correspond to productive compositionality. And of course, I'm touching here a huge topic and I'm very happy that Philippe Maella here, uh, but it's just, um, um, just a last slide to mention uh, that I'm just showing this data here, uh, thanks to Cedric and, and Cutting in Lyon and uh, Max Planck Institute, just to show that we now begin to look at the interplay between uh, bigrams, trigrams and context and the question is that what happens if I put two elements together? The meaning of this, the two elements along is retained when combined together or there is a complete switch in context and meaning. So it's like the very famous blackmailing example. Do you have a train station? You keep the meaning of the two elements or you are completely creating new type of context. And we use a very special form of Euclidean distance between the different contexts. And we see that there actually we see different type of um, uh, compositions going on. So if you, com if you look at the, the composition here, the HO uh, it stays relatively clustered here. So this means that the contexts are pretty close to one another also when you take uh, HO alone. But if you add another certain call, then there is a completely switch of meaning. And the same case is also here where we have a PG that is completely uh, moving the GR context here. So this is just a way to see that there are some cases where a certain call fulfills a certain similar function regardless of the element with which it is combined. But in some other case, another call somehow switches completely the meaning or the context of occurrence of the call. And with this slide, I would like just to propose a testing empirical hypothesis that we are putting forward now since a few years is that probably the working hypothesis over which I do not take stance, but just rather suggestions, is that maybe that Broca's area and the posterior SDG form the functional synthetic network of the adult human brain. Synthetic processing, I'm trying to show you there is an highly automatic, multimodal, domain-specific process, which work over abstract categories. We have seen this to, uh, via artificial grammar. We have seen the automaticity through, um, for example, masking and the EG studies. It's multimodal, which is regardless of uh, or whether it's speech or sign, or it's domain specific in the sense there might be a huge divide between humans and human uh, species. The arcuate fasciculus linking Broca's areas with PSTG might be the structural requirement enabling humans to combine words into abstract syntactic categories. Um, and with this, by assigning different functions to different uh, regions that I discussed before, conceptual combination, associations, and potential hierarchical processing along the structure. I would like to uh, thank you for the attention. Thanks for all people joining this uh, very important uh, works during uh, pres uh, conference during and after the pandemic in uh, online in Japan. And I would like to thank all the uh, colleagues and uh, in, in Leipzig, in Heidelberg, in Göttingen, in, uh, in Lyon, and in China, among many, and all the other lists here. My Boss Federizzi, and I would like to wish a happy Republic Day to all the Italian people here in the audience. And with this, uh, I'm happy to get uh, questions from you. Thank you very much. <clears throat>